Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is the uh, uh, second day CXO panel. Uh, we're calling it, um, what do we call it? Undependable Dependencies in Safety Critical Infrastructure. And the idea here was we wanted to, to catalyze a dialogue on uh, some of the large scale impacts, the highly consequential impacts uh, from our dependence on connected technology. Uh, and that was the problem statement of I on the Cavalry a few years ago when we started it up, was that our dependence on these technologies is growing faster than our ability to secure it, particularly in ways that impact human life, public safety, uh, national security, um, uh, GDP, and the economy. Uh, in other words, it's not just another data breach that we have to worry about. When we have planes, trains, uh, boats, cars in our healthcare system running on these types of technologies, uh, the consequences are highly, highly impactful. So as we saw in the U.S. just recently, Equifax had a breach. Um, 143 million Americans uh, apparently uh, lost anything that they might give over to a credit agency. Uh, any of the secret sauce that um, uh, the information that you would need to steal an identity is right there. Um, and that's catalyzed a, a huge outcry in the U.S. Now imagine that the same thing happened with uh, hackable cars on the roadway if, say, only 20 cars were all made to turn left at the exact same time um, on the highway. Now, I can't not use Equifax. Someone else uses Equifax and gives them my information on my behalf. I can forego buying a car. I can forego riding in a taxi, doing those types of things. That would have a huge potential impact on uh, the economy would have a huge potential impact on society uh, and the way that we get around and, and have transport and the systems that we believe in uh, and the trust in our government. We're already at a time where I would say we have a historically low amount of trust in institutions, whether it be corporations uh, or governments, um, and this only is going to exacerbate that low trust, which will cause uh, broad societal, societal issues. So we have a top-notch panel here. Uh, we're going to go and do like a couple of minutes of introduction. Um, I'll throw it over to them. And then we want to get your questions uh, and be able to answer those and engage with you. So uh, be thinking about what you want to ask these folks uh, while they're going through and doing it. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Xander first, uh, and then we'll just go down the line. So quick intro and give us a couple of minutes of thoughts. Yeah. So my name is uh, Zander Heemskerk. I work for uh, Philips as a director of product security to assure that uh, security is addressed in the products and services we sell to our customers. And I do this for the environment of their personal health. So a lot of IoT and wellness as we're merging into uh, health tech uh, type of uh, solutions. Um, and we have a program to assure that that is happening, right? Um, but the, the thought I want to give you is actually, so you've been now for two days in a conference about, uh, uh, well, hardware hacking, and I've been to a number of security conferences in the past uh, 15, 20 years, and it tends to be all of them are about vulnerabilities, and if you read the papers, it's also about vulnerabilities. But these are all vulnerabilities which seem easy to solve, because it's all basic stuff, no real, no, no, high tech, except for what I understood yesterday with the electronics microscope, that sounds like high tech. But I think that is a small percentage of the number of, of, of vulnerabilities, and then even smaller percentage is actually actual hacks like the, the Equifax. So I think if we get better education and get people uh, do what is necessary and not just rush forward into new technology, we would uh, get more dependable infrastructure. Hello, my name is Astrid Oosenbrug. I have been a MP, a member of parliament for the past five years for my party. And I got really, really frustrated because I had a portfolio about ICT and privacy. And I found out that with my 20 years of experience as a sysadmin, they didn't believe me when I said <laughs> something like uh, the uh, law on... Uh, uh, how you say, uh, uh, the WIF? In the, uh, it's about uh, information uh, like the government can control the people and it was no good. I told them why it was no good because there are too many vulnerabilities in it. 
So I came out and I started uh, co-founded a cyber workspace, a cyber workplace for uh, young hackers who are being kicked out of school because they they hacked the system and instead of helping them, we kicked them out of school and they just stay at home. So uh, I started this out of frustration and now I'm getting really happy because they help to make things better, I think. I'm sure they do, uh, Astrid. Um, hello, my name is Lies Alderlieste. I am um, the CISO for the Dutch Railways, NS. Um, I've been so for the past two years, and I have a financial background. I was CISO for Aegon, the banking sector, which seems a bit ahead, <laughs> to say the least. So venturing in this world of um, trains and, and rail tracks, um, very physical, lots of hardware, hence me being here and trying to figure out how to solve all the problems that I am uh, incurring. There is a lot of work to do. There are huge air gaps between my cyber teams and the engineers working on trains. Um, there is a lot of problems that we need to solve. Um, and I'm hoping uh, to, to sort of reach out here and um, find out people who are interesting, uh, interested in, uh, in helping helping collaboration here, because I do feel that that is the key to to trying to um, resolve this risk. And it's very uh, ethereal still to me, um, but I think we have a good chance if we collaborate together, not as hackers against, but we need to, um, to find each other in this space. So um, over to you. And my name is Erwin Koy. I work as a security architect at Aliander. We provide for about a third of the country the gas and electricity uh, into your house. Uh, I'm a security architect there for the last 10 years. And at Aliander, we're an also other grid operators. Um, we introduce more and more technology into the grid to be able to handle and to cope the different energy demands that the society uh, nowadays has. It used to be very stable for the last hundred years. It's changing rapidly now and we need to be able to cope with that. And we need more technology. We need to introduce more technology to be able to do that. And uh, security is a very important part of that. Um, so that's why we also uh, find conferences like this very interesting and very important. And the challenge that I have for um, most people here, the, the talks that I heard uh, the last two days, are uh, really on breaking stuff which is awesome, um, but it's also how would you fix this? How would you um, come to a good resolution of this problem that you found? And that would be my question back to you. Okay, so uh, we're gonna throw it open for questions now. Um, and maybe while we're, we're waiting for uh, uh, somebody to, to jump up and we'll run the mic to you as well. Um, uh, we're going over there. So yesterday at Usenix, or uh, this week at Usenix, there was this, this interesting hack on our devices, which, which, which was related to power. How, how, how do you see uh, your, your business of adding logic to the system that may also be used as an attack factor? How do you see that as a systemic, uh, how are you addressing that issue? You mean how do we address it, or do we see it in the first place? Okay. Um, well, yes, we see it in the first place. Um, uh, we have um, we had some uh, incidents happen in uh, other countries. We had some very interesting books being written, some very interesting films being made on what goes wrong if the power goes down. Um, so we really understand the impact. Um, and we have to make a trade-off between uh, hiring much more people who are not there in the marketplace uh, or adding uh, more technology. Um, so we, we go uh, more to the latter route. Um, but security is always, and uh, security design is always one of the first things that we start with. So um, what's the potential uh, impact that this introduction can have? Can we uh, containerize it? Can we divide it so that uh, if something bad were to happen, and we're not fallible, of course, um, but if something bad were to happen, then at least we can contain the problem and minimize the impact. So my follow-up question is, um, 
can you be more transparent to the users? So what can I do to isolate me from your problems before they emerge? Because you, you estimate you make business decisions about the system, but I as an end user, which is the same way this exploit yesterday w w was about, is I as an end user want to be isolated from these problems from the get-go. So you have systemic failure, but I also as an endpoint, I don't want to be uh, involved in the risks based on business decisions because I'm very well capable of paying probably for any mitigation. If I need to put up 100 euros to not have your problems in my house, th that would be worth it to me. So is there a transparency program that you have for the kind of risks that people could mitigate at their, at their end? Um, in the extreme case, mitigation is relatively easy. Uh, get a generator. Um, but uh, so, so what we try to do is to, um, you call it, socialize the cost of also of the entire system. So everybody pays the same flat fee uh, price. And it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, it doesn't matter how poor you are, everybody pays the same price. And for that amount of money, we make the system as uh, good uh, operationally, but also as secure as possible. So uh, Astrid, I'm wondering... Um, from a public policymaker standpoint, how do you, uh, how does uh, Parliament or other uh, public policy bodies see uh, the capabilities available to prepare for and respond to the type of an incident uh, that he was describing? Yeah, that's a good one because uh, we do have a cert, and they should uh, respond. But uh, I learned that they that doesn't really work very well together. So, and also the uh, the government itself doesn't has his systems uh, in order. So, practice what you preach is what I told them, and start with securing your own systems. Uh, so it's not good enough yet. So that's why I'm always talking about awareness. You have to be aware in government in in. Uh, for the companies, which is getting better, I think, but also the people, we, the people, and that's also a part that's not going uh, very well. So, in a yes, a way of the public service, there's not enough people in Parliament who understands what's going on. So, if you don't understand what's going on, so you can't create a good law or you can't create a good uh, awareness. That's how I see it. Is that an uh, answer or yeah, you no, were luck looking for something else? <laughs> More I, hope or... <laughs> I think um, based on my interactions, that's that's similar to how a lot of policymakers look, look at it. Uh, and I had the realization that when we do see something like that, um, policymakers will care and they'll get up to speed really, really quickly, but then they might take the wrong actions, right? The response um, long-term might be something that is uh, maladaptive, like, okay, well, the answer is we'll just surveil everyone so no one can get away with yeah. this in the future. Or the answer might be, okay, we're going to go to war with whoever the nation state was that did this, regardless of the fact that it might not have been a nation state. Um, or, you know, those are the types of responses that they know how to take. How can we get them then, uh, and this is a question for the whole panel, how can we get the policymakers to uh, be aware of the, um, uh, the dynamic range of potential approaches, including uh, not just a, a response once something happens, but how to prepare to prevent in the future? You want me to be the first to answer? I think you really should uh, make sure the people who are in government understands better what they are talking about because it's very incident uh, responsive behavior just like you said so you have to because if you talk to somebody who has the portfolio about uh, healthcare they know everything about healthcare as soon as you get, go to cyber security or to privacy they don't know anything about it I don't really understand how is that possible so we the people should tell them to be more aware, to speak out more, to teach them more, to send them emails, to call them, to make sure they don't, they stop responding on incidents, but have to make a bigger 
look into the future because it's happening now and they're now talking about stuff that happened five years ago. So only five years ago, wow! We, yeah, they're get, yeah, I've been there, so they are uh, getting a bit uh, better now. So, yeah. but I think that's the only way. You have to talk to your members in parliament and tell them, uh, make sure you make a new. You have to look into the future. Lise? Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, the the novelty of it as well in the in the whole train um, sector, um, there is no real cyber law yet, but we are implementing a new uh, standard for real safety signalling, which is going to be completely automated. It's called EOTMS. It's great. We're doing it European wide, but it's a technical standard without any sort of assurance. There is no policy around it, and once I kind of came round sort of mind-bogglingly that there is not nothing like that to steer it, um, I realized it's about building a capability just like you do in a company, but at a, at a higher level. Even the government, uh, we're now still fairly immature, and it will take a number of years of collaboration and working together and exchanging ideas to come to this policy, and it will be a close collaboration between all the parties involved, and knowing that, that is the reality of it. It's not a switch we can turn on. You can't just say we're, we're going to really progress really quickly and create really shit-hot security processes. It doesn't work like that, right? It's going to be a long time before something is in place. What is good, I think, is have people with some vision and strategy and execution powers to say, this is what we need to aim for, some structure of this collaboration. Government needs to step into its role and, and take its responsibility to standardize, to lobby in Brussels, and to even you know start working on this policy um, with the experts who know their stuff. And that's, I think, the only chance we have. But it's going to take a long time. Um, I'm curious how you guys out there who are actually hacking all these systems, how, how are you experiencing that? Because I think you are feeding parts of these discussions, right? Um, the Chaos Computer Club in December 2015 hacked a number of the train components in Europe without actually naming which ones, which was very helpful. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, this was one of my first, uh, it was within my first 100 days as a CISO, which was great. And then I went on to this whole... Uh, journey of trying to find out who was responsible, where in Holland was these parts used, etc., etc. But there was absolutely no way of getting back to these guys or having some conversation or in a collaborative uh, mode finding out, which would be so much more helpful. We can do a lot better than this. How can we get this to work? You guys, brilliant. You have ideas. <laughs> Wait for the microphone. Get it going. Please. Sorry. Please. Uh, I see those actions taken by the hackers are unlawful. So they will get incriminated for that. So there is no way to reach them. We, um, uh, I'm not uh, at all uh, uh, positive about that because I don't think so. We've got responsible disclosure. When it's responsibly disclosed, you know, no problem at all. That is the mechanism I think we have in place to start this. And um, yeah, it'd be good if we if we could solve this. And maybe that we should find ways of of sharing that information without that fear. Yeah, yeah I think uh, part of the solution can be providing safe spaces so that you don't have to break the law, and then having some um, agreed upon mechanisms for you know when you need to do something like that or when you have an idea for something like that, you can collaborate in good faith uh, without fear of recrimination. Yeah, I wanted to mention indeed responsible disclosure as the solution. And I think there's now there's a European initiative to make it clear to, to the hacking community that responsible disclosure is a lot appreciated. Um, not all companies do, but I know the ones with serious ones really have uh, signed an agreement that they won't f do a legal action and take it serious and will respond, etc. Et it doesn't always resolve right away into money because then a new industry starts up. But yeah, if you if you find something and you wanna you wanna find the right place to to address that, then uh, most com well the serious companies indeed have a have a way to address that. Yeah. Not, yeah. not from Philips. No. <laughs> no, maybe. Um, maybe. 
And, uh, Sorry, that didn't make it in my board. <laughs> one of the things that's been interesting over the last few years, uh, particularly in the U.S., but also over here in, in Europe, is uh, the rate of adoption of coordinated disclosure policies and conversations around that idea um, in industry and in government. And one of the things that uh, we've been doing in the U.S. is pushing uh, with, um, with this help and support of Phillips, uh, for one. Uh, Michael McNeil, one of your colleagues over there, is amazingly outspoken. Um, and he's uh, done a good job of talking with the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, engaging to the point where the FDA actually um, created a new set of guidelines for medical device makers to follow. And part of that is you have to have a coordinated disclosure policy to invite people who know about problems to the, report them to you in some coordinated fashion. Um, and uh, we plotted out uh, across the last 18 months or so, there were something like 12 or 14 individual instances within US government policy where uh, they had come out in favor of coordinated disclosure or were uh, collaborating with security researchers on that. So I think that's a, a huge benefit. Um, and now there are kind of standardized uh, templates for people to pick up and use uh, from US government. Department of Justice, for instance, just released one um, that helps lawyers overcome some of their inhibitions about it. So, so how does that work when you get things where there is uh, responsible disclosure of things and you go to the states and you get arrested because uh, the FBI have been very good at doing that recently where uh, several people have turned up to conferences uh, done responsible disclosure uh, beforehand or whatever and then they get arrested um, so the, the, you, the, there seems to be this thing where uh, there, are, there are two different approaches there's the people who think that responsible disclosure is good and then there are people who will take advantage of it are you uh, talking about Marcus Hutchins? For, for instance, yes. Okay. Um, I'm not aware of any others. That's the one that I am aware of. And he was not arrested for disclosing. He was no, arrested for... True, yes. He was arrested by implication. So, yeah. Well, he was arrested for some criminal activity that... Um, alleged. And uh, well, it's all alleged, right? Yeah. So... Um, but that's the problem with responsible disclosure. You have this exactly the same um, inference chain. I disagree with, so uh, there is an issue of when you make something apparent, there are existing established powers that don't like that. Yeah. Um, I think that we've by and large overcome a lot of those over the last 20 years. We've still got a ways to go. Uh, in the very specific case you're talking about, it wasn't that, but that has had a chilling effect on yeah. a lot of the researchers in the community because there's not a good amount of consistent awareness about out there about yeah. what was actually done, what is the evidence that um, the Department of Justice has yeah. to demonstrate that. And so into that knowledge vacuum and awareness vacuum, a bunch of theories have come out. And we yeah. don't know which ones are right, which ones are wrong. We only know what we can see from this side. Yeah. So it will be interesting to watch that case um, as, it, as it unfolds. I, I'm very troubled by it. Yeah. No matter whether he's innocent or guilty of uh, yeah. of all the things that he has done, and no matter whether or not that should have been um, uh, the that action taken, yeah, because it uh, drives a wedge between the law enforcement community and the hacker yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. chilling. Can, can, uh, can I make one comment on that? Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the um, ultimately, it comes down to trust. Yeah. Um, you make a, a disclosure, and do you trust me? Um, to, to handle that responsibly or correctly. Um, one of the reasons we're sitting here is to start building that trust. Um, on the other hand, if you are not never, ever, ever, ever going to disclose it, you have no risk. If you disclose it in some form, then, well, that might get picked up. If you disclose it to us, then we'll continue to uh, collaborate and work together. So it's there are different levels of trust and different scenarios that can work out. And it's always up to the individual on which one you choose. My choice would be to go for the responsible or the coordin coordinated uh, disclosure. Because then we will help you to um, do the right thing is not the word, but we'll help you. We won't prosecute and won't um, help you if you are in trouble or so. I mean, I haven't been to the States in the last 12 years, so... I don't have that particular risk. Um, 
but it gives also a signal to an authority, at least the Dutch authorities, that you are finding issues and you are dealing with it responsibly. And that really helps if you ever were to get arrested for some reason. So we've got uh, time for one short question and then we'll give our final thoughts. I have a question. When we talk about responsible disclosure, you need to send rapper to someone. What is the problem is that many companies, even hospitals, have not one people who want someone who is responsible for uh, security. That's a big issue. Yeah. It is a big issue. Um, and what you can do about it. So final thoughts. We'll start at the end uh, and then work our way this way. Any, uh, any last thoughts? My, my, um, uh, one of the thoughts that I would like to give you back as an audience is uh, we really like to collaborate on, on research and also in fixing vulnerabilities. Um, and personally, I am also interested in if there are ideas, how much should fixing an issue um, cost? So if we have an issue in the field and it would cost $5 million to fix it or 5 million euros to fix it, that means we can't have a new nice wind farm somewhere on the North Sea. Okay, that's a trade-off we have to make. Um, where would that trade-off be? I don't have the answer. Individually, nobody has the answer, but I think that's also um, a discussion we as a society should have. What is good enough for security and where should that bar really be? That's a very interesting thought. So collectively, coming up with the norm of what is good enough, where I think experts are not even in that far yet, right? So maybe that is... That would be great. Um, I was triggered by that model of can I choose myself, the ultimate personalization, how much risk do I allow, whether it be privacy information or I want to have less safe energy to my house. How interesting is that as a model to think about? Um, that might give some some feed to um, a new way of thinking about trade-offs, cost of securing or having private private data in the modern world. Maybe think about that. I will. <laughs> yeah, when we started the cyber workspace, we were thinking about getting people 18 and up, and we found out there's a lot of kids for starting at six, eight, ten, who are already hacking everything they see. So I think we really have to start teaching our children how to uh, program, how teach them how software works, teach them how systems work, so we can make uh, uh, teach them to make the world a better place. Because the kids are, we're teaching are learning about ethics now. They're learning about responsible disclosures. But there's a lot of kids running around on the internet these days and they don't know anything about it because they uh, th we won't teach them anything about it and they're just yeah trying to uh, well they're just curious i think they're curious i don't think they want to make things uh break things but they're just want to understand how the stuff works so we have to teach these children uh to make also your systems better so if we all join hands, and I'm just some hippie girl, I know, but that's the way I think we can make the systems better, and it won't cost five billion. It only costs us some common sense and teach our children from the start, and then we make a stronger, safer world. That's my vision. Yeah, and, and in line with that, I would think, um Indeed, education is, is the solution, but then also education starting uh, starting from an early age. But then also on risk management, if we want to get to a, a, a societal solution or what is the level of risk we want to take, we should get a risk management or thinking about risk and how to judge risk instead of always saying for the, going for the no risk uh, solution or in our mind going for no risk, that we should be more aware. So get it in high schools and indeed re-educate parliaments, re-educate um, People's in government, but uh, including re-educate people in, in companies who decide because they also have a vision that there is uh, where we're not taking any risk. While on the other end, they they want us to take risk because they still want to sell stuff, and actually, we want to sell stuff.
I'm, I'm, I'm taking it wider would be in the thinking about risk and and when we all start educating and learning about it, then we can also come up with a, so a sociological level where we all think this is acceptable or not. Because now is is technically is amateur thinking about risk. We don't want it when it happens, but we want it when when we feel it uh, it will not happen. So when it's just still this black swan somewhere in the far away. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel and thank you to the audience. Um, I'll give you one challenge over the next week, which is in line with everybody's uh, final thoughts here, which is find someone who doesn't care about security and figure out a way uh, to, to tie into their motivations, their interests, their desires, and get them to care. And then you can start having more conversations, more dialogues in a higher trust, uh, higher fidelity way and we can start to bridge this education gap and awareness gap. So thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time.